Okay, so we're live. Um, good morning. I'm just going to go through um, who I see on, I'll read off who I see on the Zoom um, for attendance, and then we'll do introductions around the table here in the office. So um, I have Tom Benware, Rogerio Rodriguez, Dave Wooden, Christina Aki, Steve Streichman, Alexandra Barr, Ed Davidson, Mike Dutra, uh, Dutra Valerie Dean, Ed Brennan, Kathleen Bell, uh, Megan Webster, Mia Luke, um, I also see Megan, oh, I'm sorry, Megan, Megan Fennell, Mia Luke, I am Simon from CDTC, Lindsay Pratt, did I miss anybody? Hey, Jen, it's Katura. Hi, Katura. Katura. Dennis Gaffney from the city of Albany. Dennis. And this is actually Ben Luke from Albany County Department of Health. Mia is my daughter. And I'm not sure why <laughs> she's um, attending this meeting, but <laughs> she's here in her place. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Okay, um, and we'll go around the table here. We'll start. I'm Elena from CDTC. I'm Rima Shania. I'm the Transportation Planner at CDTC. Uh, Tommy Tazi, Planning Director at Town Glenville. I'm Jackie Hakes with MJ Engineering. Martin Daly, Capital District Regional Planning Commission. And the Von Heide, Prince of Planning in Russell County. Uh, good morning, Andrew Tracy with CDTC. And I'm Jen Sponis with CDTC. Um, so first, um, our agenda, our first agenda item is a presentation on the Rensselaer Waterfront Connectivity Study. Um, this is a linkage type project, and I am going to hand it over to Jackie Hakes to present. Sure. Thank you, Jen. And uh, it's great to see Katora is joining us and um, Andrew from CBTC is our uh, CBTC representative. And um, I know some folks might have heard um, some of the information I'm going to be sharing with you at our public meeting. Um, Andrew, did you want to say anything? Or let me just jump right in. Well, I just wanted to say, um, you know, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Jackie's been doing a great job on this project. Uh, we, we picked off the project much earlier this year, and uh, we're in the draft concept report phase now, and everything's been been going uh, great from my point of view. Um, thank you also to Katora for joining us as well. She's been a great local partner for this. Uh, this was funded by CDTC and the City of Rensselaer through the CDTC's Community and Transportation Linkage Program, which funds concept development studies uh, for local entities. This particular study was examining uh, you know, pretty broadly scoped, but examining mobility improvements in northern city of Rensselaer, um, and, and in particular with improving connections to the waterfront uh, area of Rensselaer, which will be subject to redevelopment soon. Um, so uh, I guess I'll pass things over to Jackie to take us through the, uh, the, the, the draft concepts that are being developed. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Andrew. So Andrew hit on the project overview and the objectives, and it really is to uh, look at ways to create a more connected um, multimodal transportation network for all users and uh, to take into account that redevelopment opportunity along the waterfront and, and recognizing what that might mean in terms of future needs within the study area. So here's the study area. We have the Hudson River over here, and this is where that redevelopment uh, is, is uh, anticipated to take place. For those of you that are familiar with, um, with the city of Rensselaer, this is the boat launch. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Uh, the study area includes uh, to the south, Tracy Street, Broadway, uh, Washington Avenue is uh, a key corridor within the study area here. Um, and then it also includes, uh, for those that are familiar, uh, the Doan Stewart School is located here. And Forbes Avenue, if you can follow my cursor, is another key corridor that, that we focused on throughout the duration of this study. Can I ask a question? Is that mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, how did you decide to the limits of the study area and the, the limits of the waterfront area in particular? Uh, that was a to be able to better answer that. Sorry, you got some feedback there? Can everybody hear me? 
Yes. Okay. Um, so realistically, um, it was just looking at best ways to traverse down to the Hilton Center. Um, originally, I was focused on the Forbes Avenue bottleneck. You can see how there's a switchback down there. It makes it really difficult to access. Um, but also Washington Avenue is where the highway exit lets you off. So um, we did receive some uh, suggestions in proposals for this project where they had proposed expanding the study area, um, you know, to include the nearby neighborhood streets. But I think one of the things that we've learned throughout this is that that's almost an entirely different linkage study. Like how do we link um, these neighborhoods safely to the main corridors? But this study is specifically focusing on uh, the primary methods of accessing the sites that we're uh, seeing redevelopment for now. So really a, well, kind of a laser focus on that the Hilton area and access. Uh, Kind of, yeah, the Hilton area, the boat launch, that's where we do have tentative development. Um, it wasn't expanded to Killian's Landing right now because that's kind of its own beast. That's the area that's like north of the Livingston Avenue Bridge, but south of the boat launch. Um, but anything that improves access to the Hilton Center will improve access to that general area. So um, because this is the property that is being redeveloped, uh, you know, it kind of seemed like time to explore better ways to access it, if, especially if you've been in the existing area. It's pretty, um, pretty difficult to traverse if you're not a local. All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a quick overview of the schedule. Andrew did talk to this, but here we are the fall winter. Uh, we've had our final public workshop last Thursday. And uh, we are looking to finalize the concepts uh, based on that feedback and additional discussion with our study advisory committee, and we'll be prepping the draft report. Uh, and the city does hope to be able to utilize this uh, to seek additional funding for design and ultimately construction of uh, improvements within the study area. I do want to briefly hit on some of the public input that we have uh, received to date. We do have an ongoing active project website. It's RensselaerRiverfrontConnections.com. We post information there about the project and the public can uh, consistently leave uh, uh, comments on that uh, on a, the comment form there. Uh, we had our first public meeting in June. That was a hybrid option uh, in, in partnership with the City of Rensselaer Junior Senior High School. They have a really phenomenal setup there where we can have in-person and then also have folks join us via Zoom. Um, so we did that in June and asked folks what they see as some of the challenges and opportunities. Um, we had an online public survey that also kicked off at that same time frame and was live through uh, the summer. And uh, we did receive 84 responses, which may not seem like a large number, but this is a fairly small study area. And the responses we did receive um, were across a, a range of age cohorts, which was very uh, interesting and good uh, to hear. And um, I believe 75% of the responses were from the zip code that our study area is located within. So that's helpful to understand. And then, like I said, we had our, our uh, public meeting number two last week. Uh, and we received some input on these concepts. So what you are seeing now is what we presented last week. Some of these may see uh, some uh, modifications and refinements based on that input. Uh, Katora alluded to some of the challenges and, and themes that we've heard, uh, and, and I know the city has heard, accessibility and connections throughout this neighborhood and to the waterfront is, is challenging. There's a lack of pedestrian infrastructure, a lack of uh, cycling infrastructure, Drivers don't yield to pedestrians, and in a lot of instances, um, there's not a defined space for pedestrians to be, so it's hard for motorists and pedestrians to know uh, what's happening there. Uh, just landscaping's not attractive, uh, speeding. Topography is a pretty significant issue uh, within this, this study area. Um, however, in, in hearing from the residents, they understand that and uh, easily recognize how they need to traverse that, uh, especially on days where there might be you know, icy, snowy roads. They know which roads to avoid. Um, access to the boat launch is, is a challenge, as Katora mentioned. If you are not familiar with that area, uh, there's not really great wayfinding to help you get there. Um, and there's a, a really significant switchback. If you are trailering a boat, you are likely not going to be able to make it, uh, make that turn. And so there's, there's uh, you know, some of that connectivity is, is really what came out through this. 
So that led us to the draft corridor recommendations that I'm going to walk through very quickly, but certainly can uh, answer any questions. Um, and these are the key corridors that we've looked at. Uh, Washington Avenue is in green, uh, Broadway in red, Forbes Avenue is the blue, um, and then some key intersections that uh, seemed a little more challenging, we, we took a deeper dive into. And all of this is to create better connections internally within the neighborhood that can also allow people to get better access to the waterfront, whether uh, they're neighborhood residents or uh, visitors coming to utilize the boat launch in the waterfront. So let's focus on Forbes Avenue first. Um, Forbes it currently is a uh, two-way uh, uh, with no pedestrian access or infrastructure there. There's a pretty steep slope um, <clears throat> and currently has, uh, you know, 11-foot two-way drive lanes um, and, as I mentioned, access to the waterfront. And this is one of the key access roadways to the waterfront is, is challenging. Um, so what we looked at were two different alternatives. Um, uh, the first alternative was to uh, rethink Forbes Avenue as a one-way and integrate in a separated multi-use path, um, allowing for pedestrian access and bicycle access. Um, that would be a 10-foot multi-use path with the addition of pedestrian lighting and a pedestrian rail. Um, there would be any sort of options for separation, bollards, curb, et cetera, to be determined at time of design. The second alternative is keeping the two-way drive lanes and adding a five-foot sidewalk on the upslope side of, of the roadway. Um, and so we, we wanted to introduce these two concepts to the public, and um, we haven't had a chance to debrief yet with Katora and Andrew, but I was a, a little surprised. There was, a, there was some mixed reaction. Um, some liked the, uh, the multi-use path and some liked the two-way mm -hmm. options. Um, and I do want to point out, I'm just going to go back uh, a little bit. So the two-way option for Forbes would start here at Patton Avenue and travel down here this way. Um, so folks could still access the school and uh, these residential areas here. Um, so that was what we had proposed for that. Um, we then wanted to take a closer look at this intersection happening here with Broadway, um, Washington, and Forbes. And uh, this is where there is that hairpin turn if you're coming down Forbes trying to get over to the boat launch in the waterfront area. Um, I'm showing you the alternatives with the one-way option and the multi-use path. We also developed alternatives with the two-way sidewalk option as well, but for the sake of time. Um, so this uh, red is the uh, proposed multi-use path. Um, so the idea is that that would continue through and ultimately connect to the waterfront and the riverfront trail um, when that is ultimately constructed. So the first alternative here is looking at um, creating an extension of Washington Avenue that will bring folks uh, right down to the waterfront. Um, this would certainly need to be evaluated more, more carefully because of the grade and the slope here. It's pretty significant here. Um, but the idea is this might be you know, a very simple connection, um, adding, adding appropriate crosswalks. Um, currently, this hatched area is where Forbes comes in and then it cuts back in to get to uh, the waterfront area. Another option we looked at uh, to, to illustrate uh, is uh, instead of extending Washington Avenue, uh, realigning Forbes Avenue and creating a bit of a Y situation here. So Washington would, would end here. Uh, Forbes, uh, the one way would continue on and this is where Broadway picks up. So again, still creating easier access from a vehicular standpoint to get to uh, the waterfront while also maintaining that pedestrian access to the waterfront. Um, so we, we proposed uh, two different alternatives for this. Again, as a linkage study, there would need to be uh, more, more evaluation uh, survey design uh, to determine what, what would be done um, here. Does that first option require private property acquisition? We didn't get to that level. So. Um, the likelihood is yes, there might be some um, necessity for that, particularly um, for uh, what's happening on this corner here to mm -hmm. get the uh, to get that curvature. And then um, over here as well, we tried to stay outside of uh, the private property 
um, boundary here, but yeah, you, this gets you a little better. This is the uh, existing kind of comes down and then cuts back. So uh, the grade issue is probably the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, not like a 20 foot or a 30 foot drop there. It's pretty significant. And I think, um, I know Andrew has done some, it's anywhere from like 11, 12, 13%, 15% in some areas. Yeah. It's, it's pretty substantial. The existing grade on Washington Ave approaching the waterfront, it's already very steep. And actually at the public workshop, people were saying like, well, in the winter, we don't even go that way because of the ice. <laughs> Uh, and it's about 14% grade today. Mm -hmm. So I, I just uh, measured it quickly in GIS. We didn't do any survey, but if you continue that, the existing steep 14% grade, it should bring you right down to uh, the level of the, of, you know, before you reach the railroad tracks, it should bring you level again. Um, but, you know, then there's questions of, well, how, how long should that steep grade be before it becomes too much? But um, I mean, if you're, if you're trailing a boat, how easy is that to do for long periods of time, too? Well, That's... the the, uh, the switchbacks that currently yeah. exist are challenging to, to yeah. navigate with with a trailer. Um, so everyone with a trailer goes down to, to Tracy Street. So we expect that even with the Washington Ave extension, they might still continue to do that. And that would still allow them to use Forbes, whereas now they really can't um, use Forbes to get to the waterfront because of that switchback. Right. So either one of these alternatives would, would allow for that to happen. Yeah. Um, so moving on, and I seem to have lost my cursor. There we go. <laughs> sure it's on the screen. Um, <laughs> Uh, so then we looked at Broadway, which is a very short portion of Broadway within our study area. Um, and really the proposed improvements here are additional signage throughout. Um, we've noticed in some of uh, some areas of the study area, there are no stop signs, for example. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, there are no uh, parking signs to help people understand whether they can park there or not. Um, the addition of crosswalks and um, not only on Broadway, but throughout the entire study area, ADA compliance improvements with regards to ramps um, and making sure the sidewalks have the uh, appropriate uh, passing distance. From Washington Ave perspective, um, we're going to start with the corridor and then we're going to talk a little bit about that intersection, um, five-way intersection here at Chestnut and Fourth. Uh, we do want to point out that the city is already um, uh, completing improvements under a current PSAP project. Um, and so uh, what would be happening in the future would continue to build on some of that work they're already doing. Um, primarily existing conditions along Washington Avenue include, um, you know, 16 foot width for the drive lanes, parking on both sides, uh, planting strips of bearing width. Um, that is uh, substandard uh, at this point in time in terms of the driving lanes for, for this roadway classification. So we're proposing to um, expand the, the drive lane width to 24 feet. In order to do that, it means uh, reducing parking on one side uh, to, to just have parking on one side and still allowing for that uh, additional landscaping um, within the planting strip. And so that's what's being proposed here. Um, and interestingly, we, we didn't hear much pushback uh, from the public on, on this, um, which I was anticipating uh, anytime you try to lose parking. Um, we're going to focus next on the key intersection here. This is a five-way intersection on Washington Avenue. And again, this is really focused on, um, you know, uh, multimodal connections. There, uh, there are transit stops uh, right near this particular location. There's a lot of pedestrian activity. Uh, it is difficult to navigate. You see there's a lot of pavement there um, on Washington at this intersection, and it's hard to know where to be if you're a pedestrian or if you are a driver. Um, there are no crosswalks or sidewalks, and there are multiple conflict points. So uh, a proposed concept that we're bringing forward now, and I should point out, this is still under discussion. Um, there, uh, there will be continued discussions with the property owner here, which is currently the Lucky Times Grocery and Deli, which is a, you know, a neighborhood destination. 
Um, there's a lot of activity there, but uh, overall looking to uh, in, enhance pedestrian connections and safety. So looking at um, curb extensions here between Chestnut and 4th Street to minimize the amount of crossing distance and give a safe spot for pedestrians to kind of stop. Um, crosswalks, uh, curb extensions also here onto Washington. Um, really uh, being able to, to have a pedestrian be a little more visible to the motorist and, and know where they can be. Um, the addition of uh, sidewalks where there might be gaps. Um, we're showing here a potential sidewalk uh, in front of the Lucky Times Deli. Uh, this is a little challenging. Currently, they have parking where uh, vehicles kind of uh, back into oncoming traffic mm -hmm. in that location. So there's a, a challenge there in terms of um, how to manage the, the parking to allow for this uh, successful business to continue doing the business they're doing while balancing uh, the need for uh, a better pedestrian access and, and connectivity here. So this is what we're showing at, at this point in time. I do want to point out, we did, um, you know, Andrew had conversations with CDTA. We talked to CDTA about what they might like to see in terms of, you know, bus access here. Um, and one, one member of the public did raise the suggestion, maybe there's a bus pull off here and that can be um, something considered. Uh, we did consider that, but after discussions with CDTA, that's not their preferred um, option in terms of a bus pull off. It makes it more difficult to pull back into traffic and continue on the bus route. So this is what we proposed at the five way intersection here. So would that, would that intersection mm -hmm. have on street parking in front of the deli? There is, um, well, uh, potentially the way this is, there could be on street parking here. Um, we've also looked at um, ways to be able to uh, accommodate the parking internally here. Um, but we're, we're still, uh, you know, I know Katura and the, um, uh, the ward representative for the neighborhood who's on our study advisory committee went and talked to folks there and it's, it's an ongoing conversation okay. at this point. Um, and then I know we're going a little over, but, uh, there are several other local connections here. So these are some of the local streets. Um, that we just looked at. Overall, there's inconsistent pedestrian infrastructure, crosswalks, sidewalks, lighting. The idea is to propose to have consistency and side, you know, sidewalks that are uh, you know, uh, five feet in width, um, crosswalks where they're appropriate, add signage where it's not, it may not exist. Um, one of the challenges, however, with the local streets, this is a historic neighborhood. So local streets are narrow. The right of way is narrow. Trying to balance the parking, travel lanes, uh, as well as the pedestrian connections um, is a little challenging and is going to vary from street to street. So some of the, you know, the total uh, drive lane width might be anywhere from 11 feet to, um, you know, uh, 16 feet. So it, it ranges all over. Um, and so recognizing that uh, parking might need to be uh, uh, shifted to one side uh, to be able to accommodate uh, a little more um, access for the, for the lane width. However, recognizing there's a certain amount of traffic calming that is, uh, you know, a, a, a part of those narrow streets. And that was raised by one of the committee or one of the public uh, members that joined us. Um, so overall, just adding signage where it makes sense, uh, defining the parking spaces. We uh, we did a parking analysis for this and found um, a lot of cars park on the sidewalk <laughs> and probably because of the narrow street, but that causes obvious uh, conflicts and, and challenges uh, in and of itself. Um, so that is a very high level overview of some of the proposed concepts. Um, we will be uh, meeting again with the study advisory committee to uh, share some of the feedback we learned from the public and finalize these concepts and prepare the draft study. And we welcome you all, if you have any comments or thoughts, to also leave us any comments. Uh, we're collecting comments over the next couple of weeks um, at Rensselaer, what, uh, Rensselaer Riverfront Connections.com. That is. Well, I have. Happy to answer Thank any you, questions. There might be a question here in the chat, but I sure. Um, so Ed asked if there's trash pickup on those streets you're looking to limit parking to one side, and how is that handled? 
That's a great question. And we honestly have not addressed that. Katora, do you know about the trash pickup? On Washington? Does that focus on Washington? Ed, do you remember if that was Washington or? Um... Well, you mentioned several streets that you were talking about. There were some, there were some residential streets as well as Washington. I mean, I was just wondering so... if, if, if that had come up, if you had, <clears throat> if you had talked about that. Um, it hasn't come up. I think that we were looking to gauge how the public would react to one-sided parking first. Um, and then we, too much to our surprise, as Jackie had mentioned, nobody seemed incredibly opposed to it. Um, so that's probably mm -hmm. gonna be further avenues of exploration there before we consider the actual viability of it. Like street sweepers and things like that, I guess would be the same kind oh, of question. alternate side parking is already, um, they, I, a, a lot of places already have alternate side parking or are getting the alternate side parking, but mm -hmm. it's a big adjustment that the community is dealing with. Um, they haven't exactly nailed it down yet in the areas where we have implemented it, so. Okay. Um, Steve, do you have a question? Yes, I, I noticed, uh, Jackie, a great presentation, thanks. Uh, I realize it wasn't the focus of your study area, but you mentioned the connection to the river trail heading south. Do you mention at all connection to a river trail, riverfront trail? heading north. I know I've met with Rensselaer County and Rensselaer about eventually making that connection, but I think it should just be at least mentioned in here, if possible. Uh, sure, Steve, we haven't um, gotten to that point uh, and we don't show it on the, uh, on the concepts at this point. Um, we can certainly work with our study advisory committee and that is something that can be integrated into the text of the draft plan in terms of uh, broader regional connections, um, that I think by improving the connections within this neighborhood, uh, it, it's setting up the city to be able to, to better access some of those uh, longer term regional connections. I, I think that that would make sense and we would certainly talk with our study advisory committee about that. Okay, thanks. For uh, just the note, the ones that we were looking at, kind of the same reason that we're not looking at access to Killian's Landing. Uh, we have trail design approved for the southern portion of the trail. We have the Hilton Center redevelopment forthcoming. So it's kind of focusing on um, the existing. Uh, but as Jackie had mentioned, those countywide, the, the regional connections are definitely going to be uh, part of the, you know, part of the deliverable at the end. Well, that, and I also can see that there may be people commuting from Troy to Albany and there's actually like an ability to have like or whatever that might, you know, coffee shops and things that, that might actually go and sell things to people on the, the trail there. So commercial type of opportunity in there. Yeah, the uh, Hilton Center redevelopment does have uh, commercial space in it. So we're pretty excited about that. Any other questions? I guess my only question is when you're looking at these improvements, do you anticipate an impact on use of the boat launch or people going to that facility and needing additional parking or um, redesign of access management of that, that little park there? That may be something in, in the future that, that would need to be evaluated um, once the Hilton Center is up and running. And I think to, to get a sense of how much more use the boat launch is getting mm -hmm. um, with any sort of improvements that are that are happening now. I feel like it's a really great, uh, you know, secret in <laughs> within the city right now that access to that to that boat launch um, right now, um, and so it, it might very well um, in, increase uh, the usage of that to a point where you might need to the city might need to take a look. Um, there is a decent amount of parking there right now. Um, if you were to go down there and, um, but I think that would be something that would have to be identified later, later on. Okay. Yeah. Also the, um, so the Hilton Center redevelopment, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're setting aside space for their residents to keep boats. Um, so if there was any resulting, you know, if any additional activity resulted for the boat launch, um, it would come from a contained area. It wouldn't necessarily be associated you know they wouldn't necessarily have to traverse um forbes avenue more than once to get their boat down there in the first place hopefully um so
Great. All right. Well, thank you, Jackie. Thanks. Thank you, Katerga. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so now I'm going to attempt to seamlessly go to the other, um, the rest of our agenda items. Hopefully everyone sees the um, Active Transportation Advisory Committee a meeting agenda on their screens. Thumbs up. Yes, no. So the next item um, we have Lindsay and we might also have Steve so I'm C from CDPHP cycle with the season update. Thanks, Jen. Uh, yeah, Steve is here with me. Um, so we just finished uh, the 2022 season of CDPHP cycle. We actually turned the system off uh, last Friday evening. Uh, we had another record breaking year for ridership. Uh, last year's total had us at 70,700 rides. Uh, this year we did 80,377 as of our uh, final tallies uh, yesterday morning. So um, something that we're very, very proud of, uh, 10,000 more rides. Um, this season than last season. Um, and I'll also um, give a big credit to Steve and his team. Um, you know, we started the season a month later than we anticipated because of the new uh, controller technology. So um, Steve and his team, you know, getting the bikes on the road and keeping them in good working order so that they can stay on the road. Um, you know, taking care of 400 bikes uh, every single day for 32 weeks is not an easy task. So, um, you know, hats off to our operations team, uh, every chance I get for sure. Um, we added two, um, two new riding areas, Watervliet and Menans, um, to connect the rest of the system um, with Albany and then over into Troy. Uh, they combined for almost 1,200 rides this year. So that was a, a nice increase. Um, we saw a lot of ridership um, from the hubs that are right on the trail in Watervliet. Um, so that's something that we're going to build on for next year and also trying to um, expand a little bit more into the city and get some, some of the residents riding throughout the city, um, get some of the college students crossing the bridge a little bit. Um, something that we had talked to the city of Waterville about is that they know that college students come over, um, come over the river and, and do some of their shopping and stuff at the Price Chopper and whatnot. So um, some more target areas in that, that new expansion for us next season is something that we have on our radar screen. Um, we also put some bikes into Amsterdam at the very end of the season to complement uh, CDTA's fixed route expansion out there. Um, so those bikes moved on the trail um, as well. We, the first week we put bikes in Amsterdam, we saw someone ride a bike uh, from Schenectady to Amsterdam on a Sunday afternoon, which kind of blew our minds, but uh, also gave us some excitement for um, what potentially we could bring out to Amsterdam and give those folks uh, an extra transportation option. Um, Warren County was an expansion uh, last year. Uh, people thought we were a little bit crazy for going an hour north of Albany, bringing bikes up there, but uh, they did almost 2000 rides this year, which is double what they did last year. So uh, we gave them a couple more bikes this season, built another two racks and um, watched their ridership double. So, um, you know, we're very excited about that. We've got some more plans for them next year. Um, we saw 2,500 more rides in Saratoga this year um contribute some of that to we put more bikes in the park where people like to ride um, not only in the summer months but um we still saw some good ridership um into the fall months too after the the quote unquote you know tourist season so uh saratoga had a nice jump this year we also put bikes on skidmore's campus um so the students are riding uh into downtown also which was uh helpful in their ridership numbers uh i think steve and i will agree that the biggest win this year is uh the city of schenectady um, they more than doubled uh, ridership uh, last year. In fact, they almost tripled it. So they, for the first time, um, went over 3,000 rides in the season. They actually did 6,000 rides. So a uh, big jump for them, um, not only just Union College students, which is what we had initially in, in Schenectady doing the majority of the rides, we've also kind of tapped into the residency there. Um, we found some good apartment complexes where people really took to the bikes and, and started riding them um, around the city, which we're very, very excited for. A um, couple things to look out for next year, um, more technology up, upgrades on the bikes, uh, as well as e-bikes uh, will be here next year. I know we're all hoping to have them here at least for the end of this season, but uh, supply chain kind of got in our way and uh, shipping, uh, shipping issues, but um, we will have a, a good 
amount of e-bikes, uh, probably about three times what we thought we were going to have uh, for this season will be on the ground um, starting next season. So uh, very excited about that. Uh, they will look uh, like the pedal bikes as far as the green and purple CDP HP uh, color scheme on them. Um, but you will know that they are e-bikes. E um, you'll see the battery on the frame and, um, you know, we'll do some additional branding and, and uh, education for those. Um, but that's uh, it's kind of a quick quick summary. Um, if anybody has any questions, Steve and I are more than happy to, to answer them. But um, we just appreciate the, the constant support from this group um, as we continue to grow this, this bike share season now six years in. Any questions for Steve and Lindsay? All right. Lindsay. Oh, go ahead, Rena. Can you call me? I can when I get four free seconds. <laughs> yeah, not much. I know. I know you're so busy, but when you do get four free seconds. Um, I will. You no, you're on my list. We were just, it's been a, it's been a wacky uh, week and a half winding down the season and um, coordinating rack breakdowns, bike, um, bike retrieval and um, just kind of starting that whole process. So I, I will I, call you, I promise. I totally get it. I totally get it. Um, yeah, I know it's a very busy time for you. I, uh, your season ended later than I thought it did. I thought you guys um, were a couple weeks post season. So that's, that's no, good. We, uh, we took advantage of the mild weather um, and kept yeah. the bikes out. So. Great. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So now I know I, 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 I assumed I was on your radar already, but now that I, I know, so I will wait patiently. For your call. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking me off the bad list. <laughs> you're not on my bad. You're never on. You're never on my bad list. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, Lindsay. This is Dennis, and I just wanted to. Uh, it's amazing what you're doing. I just was curious about Albany, you know, so I can report back to all the planners here. Albany finished this season with fifty-four thousand one hundred and thirty-three rides. Beautiful. Yep, record breaking for the city uh, this year also. How much did it go up? Do you know offhand or? Uh, you went up just under 2,000 rides from last year. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep, no problem. All right. So we'll um, summarize these numbers in our meeting alerts um, if anyone didn't catch some of the details. So, but thank you again, Lindsay and Steve. No problem. Jen, I can send you this chart that I'm reading numbers off of right now, if that helps you with your note taking. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, our first CDTC discussion item is planning for Bike to Work Day in 2023. So I'm going to hand over um, the discussion to Rima, and Rima, just let me know when to move through the slides. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, we're, it's that time of year again where we're thinking about um, what to do for Bike to Work uh, for next year. Um, Bike to Work started in 2024, um, 2014 regionally, um, and it was going, um, the Bike to Work Challenge was going in Saratoga Springs um, prior to that. Um, and um, I just wanted to go through some of our program goals um, for the uh, CDTC program prior to launch into some of the discussion. So um, primary goals is to um, increase visibility of cyclists and cycling in general um, by the general public, build support for bicycle infrastructure and encourage interested but concerned cyclists. Next slide. Um, so some changes for 2023 that um, are going to be happening is that we're no longer going to be looking at doing a competition. Um, and so we're going to be retiring the trophies um, and we're no longer going to be offering t-shirts. Um, so some of the challenges that we um, are going to be experiencing in 2023. Um, so, so COVID related and not necessarily COVID related. So um, a lot of our state workers and others are still, are, are permanently work from home on a part-time basis or you know maybe even a full-time basis, um, which kind of cuts into the whole idea of like biking to work if you work from home, it's you know kind of a moot point. Um, 
And then sort of administratively and logistically, um, there's limitations related to, you know, the t-shirts and other giveaways, you know, in terms of like getting materials out from CDTC and in, out into our region, just distributing um, trophies and t-shirts and, and things like that. So there's there's some logistical and administrative issues that we were dealing with um, in the past structure of how um, the program had been run. So just um, some background context of like how the program um, Sort of the impact in the past. Um, this is a participation um, since its inception back in 2014. You know, we had like steady growth since 2014. First year, 350. 2019, we had this great year, 678 participants. It was really awesome. 2020, we were going to have this like phenomenal, phenomenal year. And then it just crashed and burned, obviously, mm -hmm. because of COVID. It was very sad. We took a hiatus and we did some like remote stuff with like pledge to ride and ditch the car and things um, and kind of like, you know, hibernated. And then in 2022, we tried to bring it back um, and it just didn't quite just really, the, the magic wasn't quite there. 275 is not a bad number though. If you think about how many people are working, you know, they're working from home and things like that. It's not a bad number. So we went, yeah, so last year we, we brought the challenge back. We had 275, 275 participants. Next slide. So um, we're thinking about, you know, possible ways forward since we're not going to have a competition any longer. Um, and well, let me pause for just a second here. What I'm hoping to get from this group today is a little bit of a discussion um, a little bit of feedback about um, ideas um, like we've done in the past. Um, having sort of had this conversation with you all for a couple of years now, um, you know, because of COVID, but, you know, in the past, we've had this conversation of, you know, how can we, how can we continue to build this program? You know, what sort of changes can we make to, you know, continue to bring people into it and to make, you know, to grow it, um, so I'm, I'm hoping to have a little bit of that conversation with you all today. Um, because we're no longer going to be having a competition, um, some, you know, possible, some questions that I have is, you know, should we still have the option of joining a team? I, I feel like maybe the idea of having a team centered around workplaces or communities might be a good way of um, creating some sort of sense of community of camaraderie with people to might be a good way to um, sort of be sort of a good, um, what we call it, um, sort of recruitment and encouragement, you know, sort of like peer, uh, I don't know, peer pressure, or like peer encouragement sort of mechanism. You want, you want um, a bike pool. Hmm? You want a bike pool, you know, like a car pool, but you have a bike pool where you're not all necessarily going to the same place. But you're coming from the same place and going towards a similar place. Yeah, like a like a like bike buddies. Yeah, but I don't know. Like you have a, you have a car pool or whatever. Well, instead you have a bike pool, like caravans. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. All right. So, um, other thoughts is you know since uh, if we're if we're not going to be offering t-shirts anymore, are there other incentives that we can or should think about? um offering instead um some people seem to like really like or want the t-shirts it seems to be like a, a a motivation for participating some people don't seem to care at all um so i kind of want some thoughts on that um and then um i want some feedback or idea or, you know, some response about this idea of offering like small grants to municipalities or others to host comfort stations or finish line celebrations in downtown locations or other locations um, as sort of like cele celebratory like um, gathering spots or um, sort of way stations along the way, you know, where you can pause and get a cup of water or 
a granola bar, or, you know, if your tires are low, you can, you know, borrow a bicycle pump um, or pick up a, you know, bike bell or whatever on your way in, or, you know, once you're at your destination, pick up a donut or whatever, and, you know, celebrate with your fellow um, bike to work day cyclists. Um, next slide. So um, some other ideas, um, there's questions of when to hold it in back in 2020 before the world shut down. Um, we had this pretty, you know, well, we were talking about bikes and bikes conversations can get a little intense, but we were talking about when to hold a bike to work day and if we should shift shift the date back a couple of weeks into June to allow for warmer weather and also accommodate for some regional um, some regional considerations. Um, and so um, I'd like to sort of revisit this question and pose uh, pose the sort of the same question again to this group is, you know, when should we hold, when should we hold our regional bike to work day um, event? Should we just sort of have every municipality sort of decide what day is best for their own community? Um, so each muni for itself. Um, some advantages of that would be that it would be flexible. Every community could choose whatever day works best for them. Um, some cons to this would be that it might be a little bit difficult to coordinate and keep organized. Um, might be a little difficult for the, the public or the messaging, but it would you know keep that flexibility piece. Um, we could put it on National Bike to Work Day, which would be a Friday, May 19th. Um, the pros would be that it's it's widely known and recognized. It's a national bike month. Um, the cons would be many office workers don't work in the office on Fridays. Um, and it's right after the workforce challenge in downtown Albany which is always the Thursday before National Bike to Work Day. Yeah. Um, and then also um, pretty much all of our regional colleges and universities are no longer in session on that Friday. Like none of them, I looked it up. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so, and then like another option would be like choosing our own sort of regional capital region bike to work day, picking a day um, and, uh, what I did last year is I picked a Wednesday a couple of weeks after National Bike Month, which was like in early June, about the first Wednesday in June, which would be like June 7th, um, have it be sort of in the middle of the week, which would hopefully more likely capture more office workers who would be more likely to actually go into the office. Um, and it would not conflict with other um, like major known regional events. And uh, many colleges and universities would um, have their summer sessions start by then. Um, some cons is that it's not known, like National Bike to Work Day is known, um, and it's not in National Bike Month. There's one thing you could do. You don't have the, you don't give the two, if you do like a giveaway and other things to promote that, you know, it's like you used to do like bike lights or something like that, and you have the capital region bike to work day on it. You might get some more people knowing about it or whatever, and then have their website on that mm -hmm. that would link them to your website so they would know if they could find out more about it. Right, just like promote, just like yeah. do some heavy promotion on that day for yeah. that day. For that day, yeah. yeah, beforehand. Yeah. I think, um, People are generally, if you want to go back to the, the idea slide before that about getting people motivated, the, the three things I think of that, that motivate people to participate in these things are related to people that like to collect things. So those would be the people that love, that want your t-shirts. Of course, with t-shirts, you have to manage the sizes and all that stuff, right. but things like medals or buttons or something that's a collectible for each year, I think would motivate people to take part year after year to be able to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, even if you're not going to make it a competition, there are people that are motivated by competition. So I wonder if there's a partnership to be had with like Map My Ride or Strava or something where you you incorporate that day and you make it a challenge um, and, and promote it through that initiative. And people may not be competing um, in the sense that you had a trophy, but they may be able to see if they join that challenge 
what their peers are doing, and that may motivate them um, to do better. Uh, and perhaps extending it for the for the for the week might be able to to uh, encourage people to do it. And secondly, I think you know joining a team is important because I think the third reason people participate in something is because it's fun and they have kind of a fear of missing out. And so I know that you're thinking about offices, but also I think of major employers where they have you know a lot of people. So warehouse operations or um, places like Target or Walmart and those types of entities where you have a lot of people that could make up these teams. And I'm thinking if you create a strata or types of industry or something like that, like the Workforce Challenge does and use kind of their model, you could actually encourage people to join a team of, of um of people in their peers professionally, as opposed to trying to struggle to get like, okay, CDPHP is going to have this many people and MVP is going to have this many people. And you could just create a strata and have it be, you know, blue collar versus white collar or, or by those jobs and be able to, you know, publish the results or do something to encourage people to join teams, even though you're not setting up the teams, you're kind of letting them self-select. Hmm. Okay. Ed has a comment or uh, yeah, I mean, just playing off your idea that like people like to collect things. Um, like the national parks has that like that little passport booklet kind of thing, where people like go to a, every time you go to a national park, you walk into the bookstore and get like your book stamped. So I don't know if you could, and and you did sort of do sort of this kind of thing with the ditch the car, where you have like different um, bike pads and things like that, where people if they went to that bike path they could check off that they did it but maybe if people had something like an actual little book or something like that that they could go in and then they could get their stamp at the local stewards along with like a free ice cream or something like that if they did that new piece of infrastructure during like bike week or something like that um, and then they could collect however many they could collect um, you know, in that period of time. It obviously couldn't be a day because people can't get through the whole capital region on a bike in a day. Maybe somebody can, I can't, but just, uh, but the, you know, I played off the idea of people collecting things, which I like, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about the, do the employers get in this? So I'm wondering if um, maybe you can tap into them to provide some incentives. Um. In our region, we haven't we haven't really made a, a real concerted effort to try to get the employers involved in it. In other regions, nationally, um, uh, employers can get really heavily involved. Um, Is it a matter of time to not enough time to? communicate with the businesses. You know, it, it really depends, like, um, you know, like other other regions, like their bike to work um, events are run by like regional coalitions, like bike coalitions. Um, and it's just, it's just structured differently. Their programs are structured differently. So like they can, they have like the, the sort of the manpower and their funding is structured so that they can kind of go after that kind of yeah just thinking that <clears throat> instead of you trying to figure out everybody's t-shirt size if the employers could that yeah it just it, um yeah we sort of have like a captain structure where like i would communicate with captains but it's still like it's still very administratively time intensive to communicate with uh, Everybody. 60 team captains who may or may not be responsive and may or may not give me reliable information. <laughs> We've also had like chambers of Congress kind of promote, especially in Saratoga County and do stuff. But I think Tom Benware has a comment. Uh, thank you, Dan. I, I guess it's still okay to raise your hand uh, if you have a question or a comment on Zoom. I am. Uh, yeah, uh, so just a couple of comments. I, I would think employers m might want to just m might utilize this as a team building exercise, um, you know, whatever your teams are around, uh, you know, what your 
you know, what your workplace is doing, there might be some interest there. And then secondly, I was sort of drawn, um, Rima, to the bullet uh, of encouraging uh, the um, curious uh, but concerned, interested but concerned uh, group um, and thinking about, uh, you know, rules of the road, bike safety, bike skills, and um, maybe uh, uh, encouraging folks to, you know, engage in a little bike education prior to the bike to work uh, event um, might be something to think about. Yeah. Tom, that's exactly um, something that we're interested in doing as well, um, and that's one reason why we created the, the Bicycle Safety Training Grant Program. Yeah, uh, cool. It has the, the adult, um, you know, trainings offered through that too. Unfortunately, that we didn't get any hosts um, stepping up to, um, to, you know, offer to do adult trainings for 2023. So we'll have to figure out, we'll have to think about, you know, if there's a plan B for that mm -hmm. for 2023. Um, a couple of thoughts maybe, and this might be adding more work. <laughs> so it might be a non-starter, but what about expanding, you know, bike to work day to bike to work week? It offers more flexibility. And if you're talking about, um, you know, creating some sort of um, self-guided competition, if you will, folks can say, oh, you know, I, I rode five days or I rode three days and, and it might provide more flexibility for those that are working from home if they have more than just a single day to participate. Um, it would require a, certainly, you know, a big, a big publicity push, but there might be um, larger employers within the region that you could partner with to help offset some of the additional costs, to help offset some of the additional publicity, um, if they might be willing uh, to do that. So just an idea, but the idea also of pushing more back onto those that are participating, giving them the options um, of how they can participate and kind of create their own competition within the, the you know, bike to work week or bike to work day even uh, structure. But just something to think about. Um, yeah, to provide some flexibility and maybe get more attention. Um, yeah, to the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and Steve Strickman said, from the municipality point of view, we would never pick a day. Um, and Ed said, a week is better, better chance of getting decent weather. Yeah. Here's something else, um, and then I'll stop coming. Um, was it last year, or maybe it was two years ago? Um, uh, Canals had that um, bike challenge where you had like a month mm -hmm. to be able to get, you know, 200 miles, and you could do that. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying a month, but but maybe there's, you know, maybe there's some way to to set that up. And again, it's it's a little. You set the framework, but there's um, a certain amount of responsibility for those participating to, to help kind of manage themselves um, through whatever that competition is. But yeah. I, the Albany Hibernian Hall had, um, they called it a race to end hunger, and it was a virtual 10K. And so you signed up and then you logged your miles on their website. And once you reached a certain point, they'd give you a medal and a t shirt. It was an on your honor system. But again, mm -hmm. it goes to that collector thing. Because once you get that medal, you're like, oh, this is cool. I want one of these. Yeah. So um, it's a way that people can self-report. Um, you don't have to track things. And um, mm -hmm. it kind of puts the onus on them to participate. And if they do it over the course of a week, you can really get them to add up the miles. Especially if you do it the whole week for National Bike to Work Day, you make it the whole week for the Capital Region. Mm -hmm. People go to the website, they log their miles, and then you celebrate the people that did it with mm -hmm. a trinket, a pin, or something. Yes, Selena. What if you guys did like a raffle? Like everyone who participates like, can join a raffle, mm -hmm. and that's like an incentive. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay for something for everyone. Mm -hmm. What would you raffle off? Um, I don't yeah, know, maybe like something right? with like local businesses, like mm -hmm. work with the local people to a car. find a good. And then like everyone else just gonna take a sticker because people love <laughs> Okay. 
A lot of the bigger employers, they, I don't, I forget the terminology. They have these uh, committees or whatever. They encourage people to do healthy things or whatever. Uh -huh. I don't know if there's some way of getting a hold of companies that have that or even send, I have to figure out what the name is. But it's like, it, it, it's like if you can contact the businesses and say, okay, if you can send this to your local community and let them think about this or whatever, it might also be a it's sort of like I know my friends' businesses like they have uh, um defensive driving courses. They have other things that you know. It's like so this is something healthy they can do too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I know Union if they participated in like work day Union College employees. I mean they like they get like gift cards for everything they do. But if they did like National Bank to work today, it would like it would go towards Good their point. like health points for yeah. the year. It's so, again, yeah. 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 You could, um, since Albany Med will mail you 18 times for the same medical procedure you paid for the first time, maybe an organization like that could slip into their bills uh, for these types of programs. Anyone worth at Albany Med on here, we're sorry about your billing. Your billing department. <laughs> so maybe I need to get in with like MVP and CPHP. Yeah, if they get like a what a, a half by three by five insert and they stick it in anything they mail out already. Well, and I mean, I know they promote like healthy with lifestyle stuff. So, I mean, that might be something. Yeah, definitely. I just like get really cozy with MVP and CVP. I think they would end all of off a month of insurance if you close your rings when you walk. Close your what? Like your ring. Yeah. Because you're like walking, yeah. standing. So, like, that would. Another way to another way to do it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want to hit up the bike shops. <laughs> they're always they're always you know that that that's another uh, way to get you know a gift card or maybe a discount perhaps if you want to put that in the raffle. Yeah, uh, you know I was thinking that maybe um, a good incentive would be like, and I was trying to tie this back to like safeties like safety gear, because, um, you know, trying to think about like what sort of, what, like thinking about our funding streams and like what we can and can't spend money on, like we can't spend money on just anything. Like I, I can't like spend money on, you know, like lunch for 50 people oh, as, a, as a prize, but I can spend money on like safety gear. So I was thinking what? like, maybe I could offer you know, uh, you know, gift certificates for safety gear to local bike Re shops. Re reflective, these reflective vests or something like that, where people, yeah, you know, it, yeah. It, it's like a t-shirt. You gotta wash it or whatever, but you can put the reflective vest on it every day. And, you know, yeah. You wash it. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people okay. would like those vests or helmets or lights or whatever. Yeah. So what what are your feelings about so Steve Strikeman weighed in about municipalities his municipality for one will not pick a day okay all right um, what's our feeling about um, going with like the National Bike to Work Day or National Bike to Work Week would be the week of May nineteenth or or like pushing it into June. So that it doesn't conflict with um, workforce challenge and um, the college university schedule. What are what are our what's our collective group thoughts about that? In May it's cooler, and in June it can be hotter. So I don't know. And then that. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it, it, you could also benefit from some of the publicity for National Bike to Work Day, right? So it <laughs> might not be as big of a lift. To publicize the capital region um like the work day but they're yeah that's a tough time as brennan said keep it in may bike month but make it a week yeah. okay. i like no, the idea no. of the week i think we did that once where it was a week yeah. when we did when we did the bike to work challenge it was always a week there was always like a national there was always like a, a bike to work day but that you could bike to work any day that week yeah um and, and you could always push it up the week before that because I think the colleges are still somewhat in. I think let's see, May nineteenth, May twelfth. Yeah, it's like that's I think the last week of college in a lot of them. I think so. 
I just feel like it could be even colder and wetter. If you're going to have an event that that celebrates bike and work, capitalize on bike to work day with the national attention focused on it. Just because it's going to be out there, it's going to be in the conversation. And so people are going to get hit with that message regardless. So doing it another time, I think you waste the the excitement around the national event and ways to build upon on that. So same week to coincide with National Bike to Work Day, I think will be great. And I, you know, workforce challenge is great, but I don't think you, you're going to get a significant amount of uh, of opportunity cost in having the National Bike to Work week, the same week that workforce challenge takes place. So the thing is, and here here's the thing. The majority of the people who have in the past participated in Bike to Work Day mm -hmm. have been downtown Albany participants. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the people who participate in the Workforce Challenge are downtown Albany participants. So they're kind of cannibalizing each other. Yeah, but as if you move it to a week, you won't be cannibalizing that event. That we always we always do a week. Mm -hmm. It's always been a week and it's always been the same yeah. as a Workforce Challenge. Yeah, and they, they warm up. Bicycling to work on Monday, and then I have a few rest days and then we can run on Thursday. It's a wellness week. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, it's only three weeks long. It's a 5K. Yeah. The other advantage to that is if you have a booth at the Workforce Challenge, you can announce the results of the of the thing or draw the raffle winner, or, or, or you can glom on to that as an event. Or, so you got one more day left. So. Mm -hmm. Is health insurance, do they, um, is it a health insurance company that sponsors the workforce team challenge? It was CDPHP, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. It used to be like GHI or something. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and it was and called the corporate challenge, and then it got rebranded to workforce challenge. Yeah. So. so maybe like they can make an announcement, like, you have one more day. So I do. Maybe, you know, once you have a bicycle bike, does the workforce? Mm -hmm. Um, maybe we can put together just like a, a poll to put out with the notes on like the date or something. I mean, unless we feel like we've, we've gotten a, a solid response on that. I already did. I mean, we're having the same conversation we had in 2020. Okay. So is there anything left? I don't think there's anything else. To say. Right. No. Okay. So as we move forward with this, Rima, we'll just keep everyone updated and see based on like the feedback we got today, um, you know, how the final plans for the event kind of shake out. That sound good? I'm sorry, what? Based on the feedback we got today, mm -hmm. we'll, We'll move forward with planning the event and then, then keep the committee updated on how it all. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, yep, and Tom had one more comment. Being part of the national event is preferred to take advantage of the dialogue and media around that event. Thanks, Tom. All right. So it is 10, it's a little bit after 10. Um, so I'm going to go through the next agenda items quickly because we do have another meeting here at CDC at 10 30. Um, so just an update on the 2023-24 Unified Planning Work Program. Um, CDTC released the solicitation earlier this fall, making up to $1 million available in funding um, to assist with planning. And we received 18 proposals requesting over $1.2 million. So staff is in the process of evaluating these proposals that were submitted November 30th. Um, the plan is to uh, propose programming recommendations to planning committee on January 4th um, to have a draft 2023-24 UPWP presented for approval to planning committee in February. Um, that approval would move the draft to the public review and consultation period, which will be basically the whole month of February. And we will plan um, a number of events and strategies for people to gather feedback on it. And then the final um, UPWP would be anticipated to be adopted at the March policy board meeting. And um, 
to follow, you know, to find more about the UPWP, we have a lot of information on our webpage and we'll keep that updated um, with information as we move along. The other announcement since our last meeting is the Bridge New York um, funding. So there is funding allocated for county uh, project proposals are due January 6th. We tried to kind of pare down, streamline our TIP evaluation process to fit this program. Um, we have a really tight timeline for evaluating and um, programming projects. So again, we anticipate approval of these projects in March, the program. Um, another update, Hiam presented on traffic changes due to COVID-19 to our committee a few months ago. There was a final memo that was presented to both planning committee and policy board linked to on our webpage. It's on if you go to, um, I can't see, committees and then policy board, you'll see um, agendas uh, for recently, recent meetings or past meetings in the archive and you can find the link there. Um, just some updates on trail planning. I know last meeting we kind of talked about the eco counters and some of the things we are observing. We did test and get in contact with eco counter about that counter on the Skyway and found that the trends and general um, use, like the you know ratio of towards waterfront versus towards downtown, those were all correct, but the raw numbers were very incorrect. Mm. And there was a problem with, um, as it gets colder, uh, heat around is a little bit, it's more sensitive to any heat. So, and as the, the uh, what's it called? Radar, I don't wanna call it, it sounds radar, so it's kind of silly. Um, oh, uh, LIDAR? The, or the light, sensor, light, yeah, light sensor. The sensor is like a cone, and the further away it goes, the um, wider the sensor can pick up. So the heat from cars on the ramp, even though it was like more than 20, 25 feet away, it was picking that up. So um, so we are still learning more about these eco counters and the best places for them to be installed. So really on those set, completely separated facilities um, is still the best option, even though they say that, that you can use them in mixed traffic and stuff. We're seeing some problems with that. Um, the Park Trails New York and the Office of Parks, Recreation, Historic Preservation are working together um, to develop an annual progress report on the Empire State Trail. So if you have ongoing trail maintenance or new trail projects, they are looking to get your information and um, include them in their annual report. They're also developing a Greenways Trails Development Guide. And um, we are going to have OPR, Chris Morris from OPRHP come and talk, present to the committee about the ongoing statewide trail planning initiatives. Um, and again, this is related to the counts. The state is trying to coordinate counts um, since a bunch of different organizations and municipalities are doing their own counts now. Parks and Trails is trying to develop a, a standardized um, methodology and updating the National Bicycle Pedestrian Documentation extrapo Extrapolation Methodology, which is what CBTC has been using. Um, but we are coordinating with the other statewide groups on this so that we can share data and um, contribute our data to the statewide report and tracking. The CDTC CDRPC Technical Assistance Program is still open and we are accepting applications on a rolling basis. Just a reminder that the bipartisan infrastructure law information is posted to the CDTC website. Um, we update it as we learn new information. As the ongoing um, implementation of our long range plan new visions this afternoon, that's wrong, December 13th, I'm sorry. Um, this afternoon, there is a webinar as part of this series. It's on freight planning and land uses. 
today at 3.30 and there are CM credits for AICP available if you attend. Um, we are planning on updating the Metropolitan um, Transportation Plan with uh, anticipation of it being adopted in 2025. So that means in our next UPWP, we will begin really doing the work to, to update this, including collecting data, um, developing and promoting a regional trends report and some other initiatives. And lastly, um, this was attached to our agenda and I know it's probably really difficult to read and there's a lot of information here because there are a lot of ongoing projects um, here at CDTC. Today we learned about the draft recommendations from the Rensselaer project. We have a lot of projects that are just getting started um, like the Sand Creek Road Complete Streets Feasibility Study the City of Schenectady, Albany and Crane Street study, and the Town of Brunswick Acoustic Road Corridor study, um, and some other projects are wrapping up, like Federal Street um, and the Village of Manans. But I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, I, they were attached to the agenda, and I'll also attach them to the notes. So it is 10:20, um, and we have a good comment in the chat. Thank you, Tom. Tom wanted to thank Rima and CDC for putting together the bike skills training day for the MLK School of Excellence in Schenectady. Um, nice work and fun. Thank you, Tom. Um, um, and next meeting, we'll be able to share the <laughs> bike skill, youth bike skills training for our next UPWP year. Um, and that and details for that program moving forward. Um, in the interest of time, we'll skip going around and doing any um, big updates unless there is anything that is urgent. Um, otherwise, we will see everyone in January. Um, the next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, January 10th. I hope everyone has a great and safe holiday. Um, and that's it. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you.